What is up, Humanoid Nation? So today's reaction I'm reacting to is by Wrestle with Andy Gimmick Infringement, Wrestling's Greatest Copycat Characters. So we got the Renegade for the Ultimate Warrior, Fake Diesel for Diesel, Gilbert for Goldberg, R.I.P. Uh, Big Titan Rick Boo, not uh, Rick Bogner, not Rick Boogs for Fake Razor Ramon, and Black Machismo Jay Lethal for Macho Man Randy Savage. But let's see what else he has to say. Let's see what other characters we can think, come up with. All right, let's do this. There's a saying that goes, talent imitates, genius steals. And if you're a fan of pretty much any form of entertainment, then you'll probably already know this to be the case. After all, who are Led Zeppelin, if not a band that heavily borrowed much of their music and lyrics from old blues songs of the past, reworking them from there into something new? And if you're more of a movie buff, you'll be all too aware that Quentin Tarantino has made a career out of remixing his favorite cult films, turning them into legitimate box office hits in the process. So it should come as no surprise then that the wrestling world is no- I feel bad for the renegade though. This man was told that he was given the world, and then he goes and shoots himself months later, cause like, they promised him the world and he got so depressed and just committed suicide. I feel really sorry for this dude. Stranger to this phenomenon too, with some of the greatest and not so greatest gimmicks of all time being almost wholesale ripped off from someone else. So join us today as we take a look at some of the best examples of this in gimmick infringement. Wrestling's the greatest best examples? copycat okay. characters. But you're, wait, how is and fake diesel the best example? Somewhere, then we might as well start with one of the most famous superstars of all time, and that's the nature boy, Ric Flair. Yeah, I forgot he did a gimmick infringement of Buddy Rogers and Buddy Landell, but who was first? Buddy Rogers? Buddy who was Buddy Landell, right? I think so. Yes, despite being regarded by many to be the greatest in-ring wrestler ever, and the man who made the gimmick famous by taking it all across the world as the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion, Slick Rick was not the first person to use this one as, prior to him coming to the forefront in the mid-1970s, Buddy Rogers was Buddy the original Rogers, nature Buddy Rogers, that's the one. And it wasn't I thought it was Buddy Rogers Randall wasn't for some figure reason. in the industry either, as throughout his decades-long career that started all the way back in 1939, he'd become one of the most famous wrestlers on the planet planet after picking up notable wins over the likes of Ed Strangler Lewis and Lou Thez. This then would see him become a four-time NWA Texas heavyweight champion, as with his bleached blonde hair and cocky attitude, he'd proclaim himself to be the nature boy, the, nature the boy, unbeatable the heel one. of the territory. Soon after that, and he'd expand out nationwide as he started working for the likes of Sam Mushnick in St. Louis and Vince McMahon Sr. in New York, all while booking his own territory in Chicago. And come 1961, all this hard work would have paid off when he became the NWA World Heavyweight Champion after defeating Pat O'Connor in what was, at the time, dubbed the match of the century. I wish Following I could find this, that match. He became the inaugural WWF champion. But oh, these black and, and white videos are so hard to find. In Especially when the network doesn't have which all only further them on cemented there. his legacy as a legend of the business. So that was why, upon trying to figure out a new gimmick for himself in 1974, Ric Flair would outright steal the Nature Boy's moniker, look, and attitude, something which Rogers was only too happy to give the go-ahead for once he saw how good the youngster was in the ring. After that, Flair would go on such a legendary run that by the 1980s, he would be the true Nature Boy in many people's eyes, an opinion which is hard to argue with when you take into account the fact that come the end of his run, he'd have won at least 16 world titles and had some of the greatest match at the end of his run, Hold on he'd a have won at least 16. Does anyone know if the NWA title has always been like this? I don't think any time they ever changed it throughout all the years. It has the same constant look even to this day, the same... It's a classic belt, nonetheless, but I'm wondering if they ever changed it or not. Teen world titles and had some of the greatest matches of all time. But as it happened, he wouldn't be the only person doing the Nature Boy gimmick in the 80s because, while he was riding high as NWA world champion, Buddy Landell was also taking up the moniker. A certain and while nature he wouldn't boy. have the same level of success as Rick did, Landell would also make a nice career for himself as a multi-time regional heavyweight champion, proving that the character is seemingly impossible to not hit a home run with. And the Nature Boy hasn't been the only stolen gimmick that saw someone rise to the top of the industry as, over in the WWF at the Superstar same time, Superstar Billy Graham, was taking my brother. more than a few cues from Superstar Billy Graham. 
Then yes, Jesse Ventura did it, the and then Hulk Hogan. muscle-bound look of the Hulkster was something he came up with by himself, then you'd be very Superstar wrong. Billy Graham was such a great talker. Before Hulkamania swept the world, Billy Graham was showing off his massive pythons in the AWA, NWA, and WWWF. In fact, it was in the latter promotion that the superstar would be the one to dethrone Bruno San Martino and end his second reign as WWWF Heavyweight Champion, something which would trigger a whole new era in the company. So, clearly taking notes then, a young Hogan would debut in the NWA just a few years later and there, okay, so Hulk Hogan for himself, was the second. One who so Jesse the no, wait, wasn't Jesse Ventura? Suspiciously like the and former Hulk Hogan? WWF Champion. Of course, you all know what happens next. After developing this into I mean, a baby face brother. gimmick, the Hulkster would take the industry mainstream and spark the golden age of WWE, with him becoming a pop culture icon from there and arguably the most famous wrestler in the world to this day. And how did Graham feel about this? Well, not great as it happened, because upon feeling like he'd been ripped off, the superstar would talk a lot of trash about Hogan publicly in the years following this. That said, it appears like any ill feelings between them have since been mended, as by all accounts, they appear to be on good terms now, something we can't necessarily say is the same for Ryback and Goldberg. Now, to be fair, we don't know for certain that there's bad blood between the two, Ryback. but given how Ryback likes to piss everyone in the industry off my at this God, point, we does. wouldn't be surprised to hear that there was What can you say about Ryback? But of course, if anything, Ryback should be thankful to Bill, because had it not been for the latter's run in WCW during the late 90s, where he went on a 173-match winning streak and became the face of the company in the process... 173 winning streak. Like they made that number up, what how shows... He went from three wins to all of a sudden ten. So they made up a lot of numbers. Says the big guy might never have had the template to work from. Yes, dominating figures in wrestling are nothing new, but the whole presentation of Goldberg was clearly an inspiration for Ryback, as upon the character's debut in WWE in 2012, he would feature a suspiciously similar bald-headed and muscle-bound look, all while going on a win streak of his own. And this would quickly lead to many fans chanting Goldberg at him whenever he came out, with them loving the remix of the Unstoppable Monster hmm. going on a win streak. Hmm. He'd More. find himself in a WWE he went title full match Goldberg when he started wearing all black. Punk Just black at the end of the year. Unfortunately, trunks. though, not wanting to take the title off of Punk yet, WWE soon realized they'd booked themselves into a corner, and so, inside Hell in a Cell, they were forced to end the challenger's streak early. After that, his momentum would stall as he lost two more attempts at winning the big one, that all before then falling into the axle, upper mid-card right role as he became shit. a foil to the likes of The Shield. Yes, while it was a good idea to try it out, in the end, the whole Ryback experiment never succeeded in creating a star on the same level of Goldberg. That said, he can at least take solace in the fact that his one-time tag team partner Curtis Axel would have an even more disappointing run. And this one is even sadder because, as the son of Kurt Henning, Axel should have been a surefire hit when he debuted with the company in the early 2010s. Uh, but he kind of fucked it up for himself when, on NXT, like, from this moment on, promo, and his horrible IC title run. Oh my, Curtis Axel was very good, but he didn't last, he was going downhill way too quick. Unfortunately, though, with him being far from perfect in the ring and limited on the mic, too, from this moment, at you, Genesis of McGillicuddy promo, he ended up quickly slipping into an undercard role after a failed run as a Paul Heyman guy in 2013. Even Paul so Heyman couldn't make him like a, Paul a second Heyman shot guy. at life then when, in 2015, and this is Paul the son of Mr. Perfect would begin a new comedy gimmick, which saw him team with Damian Sandow to start Axel Mania. And the reason for this was that, by then, Sandow was already working a gimmick as Macho Mandow, a pretty funny imitation of Randy Savage. So, needing a Hogan to complete the new Mega Powers, Axel would start coming to the ring in full Hulkster regalia, with him from there proclaiming that the upcoming WrestleMania 31 would be the birth of Axelmania. Of course, as a complete comedy jobber by this point, things would not go to plan for Axel as, at the showcase of the Immortals, he'd fail to win the Andre the Giant Memorial man, Battle Royal. First man out. After that, though, the 21st Century Mega Powers would formalize their union with a very intense handshake as, from there, they hoped to rebound by winning the tag team gold together. Sadly, however, before that could happen, the Axelmania gimmick would be dropped when a private tape of Hulk Hogan using racist language was leaked to the press, oh, causing that. the company to cut ties with him Damn, for a while Hulk. as they let the heat die down. 
And this was a shame, because with the gimmick in place and his partnership with Sandow set, it looked like Curtis Axel was finally... Like Hulk Hogan doing no that, oh my god, but his son is even way more piece of shit. For like, getting his best friend paralyzed and have brain damage. Even have it on tape that went Nick, like, oh, it, God did this to him, not you, Nick. The fact Hulk Hogan said that, oh, you gotta look that up, that video tape, when he visits his son in jail. Oh, God. Starting to get over. But of course, while this imitation game might have been new to him at the time, something which led to him struggling to recover, it was far from the first time his tag partner had undergone such a change, as prior to that, he'd gotten himself hugely over as Damien Mizdow, the personal stunt double to The Miz. Yes, this one started when, after getting the lead role in the WWE Superstars-produced film The Marine 3 in 2013, The Miz would come back to the company under a new gimmick of someone who thought he was now a Hollywood A-lister. And as an A-lister, of course, there was no way he was going to do his own stunts anymore. So instead, Maybe he'd bring in Damien Sandow to take the role of his own personal stunt double. But while this gimmick might have looked like death at first, Sandow, or Mizdow as he was then becoming known, quickly became a hit with both fans and his peers watching backstage as, standing at ringside, he'd mimic every bump the Miz took, creating some comedy gold moments in the process. In that fact, was a great so thing about Nick Damon that after doing a while, the exact same thing it was Miz him, and not the Miz, who people really wanted to see, with them going as far as to chant, We want Mizdow, whenever the two came to the ring. And this then led to the delusional A-lister getting jealous of his stunt double, causing friction between the two- Can I just say, Miz is the greatest worker ever? Sure, I didn't like him when he first started because he was annoying as fuck, but then I gained respect for him for like that promo on Raw when he won the US title. He went off, and then when he won Money in the Bank, he did that utter promo, and I've been respecting him ever since. He's a hard worker, the Miz is. The, he's a hard worker. But like Daniel Bryan says, he wrestles like a coward, but I enjoy him. Two that would eventually lead to them blowing up during the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania 31. After that, it looked like Sandow was ready for a big babyface push, but unfortunately, for one reason or another, this never came to pass, and instead, he'd spend a couple more years milling around on the mid-card, all before reinventing himself again as Aaron Rex in both Impact and the NWA. And he wasn't the only person who's been able to reinvent himself in Impact over the years either. Hell, he wasn't even the only macho one to do a great man. Macho Man impression. As back in 2006, Jay Lethal would stumble upon a hit with Black Machismo, of course, by this point, I didn't like it at first, but I grew to love it after. Likes of Ring of Honor and building a name for himself as one of the best in-ring wrestlers on the planet. That said, it wasn't until he joined TNA that his character skills would really get a chance to shine. Teaming up with Consequences Creed, quite possibly the AKA greatest Savage impression. Xavier going Woods. Back. And this would first come to light when, in December of 2006, both he and Sanjay Dutt would start appearing in backstage segments with Kevin Nash. Segments where Big Daddy Cool would try to give him a makeover by drawing more character out of him. And all that would eventually lead to a segment called Paparazzi Idol, a play on American Idol, which saw Lethal impress the series of judges by doing a pitch-perfect recreation of the Macho Man. So with this new skill uncovered, the former Ring of Honor star would lean and into Sunday it more Duck heavily gets the in the groove, followed, which pretty much didn't go anywhere. Circumstance, all while dressed in full savage attire. On top of that, now rechristening himself as Black Machismo, he'd borrow some of the former WWF champion's moves, such as the diving elbow drop finisher, all while claiming the Macho Man's famous ooh yeah catchphrase while he was at it. And this would prove to be such a hit with fans that soon after, Lethal would be competing for both the X Division title and the tag team titles. As well as that, he would go on to claim to have gotten the direct blessing of Savage himself after having had a phone call with him. Something which only motivated him to go even further as, by June 2007 Slammiversary, he'd win the X Division title for the first time after defeating Chris Sabin. But didn't Jay Lethal say he wasn't sure if that was Macho Man on the, on the phone because anybody can do a Macho Man voice? I don't know. That's what, didn't he say that? He was like second-guessing himself if that was really the Macho Man on the phone?
Yes, with just a little sprinkling of macho madness, Jay Lethal had become a made man, and over the next couple of years, he'd end up having a second run with the X Division title, all while also getting the chance to ape the famous Savage and Elizabeth engagement segment when, in his best gravelly voice, he'd get in the ring with his, at the time, on-screen girlfriend SoCal Val and ask her, Will you marry me? But for as successful as Black Machismo turned out to be, the same couldn't be said for another figure who tried to mimic a popular WWF star of the Hogan era, as well the Ultimate Warrior may oh, have been a the top renegade. Guy, the Renegade was I feel so to the sorry for this barrel. dude. Of course, the, the history world. of this one is somewhat shrouded in mystery, as <sighs> while many still claim the Renegade had been brought into WCW during 1995 specifically to build up to the Warrior's eventual debut, Eric Bischoff has always argued this wasn't the case. No, instead, he just apparently thought it would be funny to have Hulk Hogan, while engaged in a feud with Ric Flair and Vader, spend weeks hyping up an ultimate surprise, a surprise which, when seen in silhouette, looked suspiciously like a certain former challenger of his. So with fans clearly expecting Jim Helwig to show up then, they were all left disappointed when, instead, the Renegade made his debut at that March's uncensored pay-per-view, coming out to a cheap knockoff of the Warriors' WWF theme, and Yeah, a lot of people were pissed when moves. he came out expecting it wasn't fans Warrior. Were disappointed, Eric Bischoff, clearly still in love with the idea, decided to keep going with it anyway, as in the weeks and months that followed, the Renegade would pick up Jimmy Hart as a manager and then go on to defeat Arn Anderson for the WCW World Television Championship. After that, though, with things clearly not getting over, the boss admitted defeat and sent his new signing down to the mid-card as, from there, he would become something of a joke, making yeah. fewer and fewer television appearances as time went on. And even when he did turn up, he'd usually be on the losing end, something which continued all the way up until 1998, at which point the real Ultimate Warrior would debut with the company, pretty much destroying any remaining relevance the Renegade had in one fell swoop. But he wasn't the only cheap WWF knockoff WCW would put out there around this time. Asia. Just a year later, the then failing promotion Asia, would try yeah. their best to capitalize on the success of China. Don't know much about Vince Asia McMahon's since I didn't company, watch the last year of WCW. They introduced their own muscle-bound female, Asia. Yes, the name leaves little doubt as to what was going on here, but, well, things like this have worked out in the past when it came to Christy Wolf, the woman who portrayed Asia. God damn, she just uh, wasn't the performer that Johnny Lohr was. Still, that didn't stop WCW's then-head writer Vince Russo from trying his best to get her over, as throughout the winter of 1999, he'd book his newest creation to join the Revolution, a stable made up of Shane Douglas, Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, and Perry Saturn. Of course, come the start of 2000, three of those men would have joined Eddie Guerrero in jumping ship to the WWF, leading Asia to turn babyface as, from there, she would venture out onto her own. And at one point, she'd even challenge Medusa for the WCW Cruiserweight Championship, only Wait. before then getting into a brief feud with o Asia challenging Medusa for the Cruiserweight Champion? Okay, it's WCW. It's weird. It's weird. Oklahoma, co-head writer Ed Ferraro. Oh my god, Oklahoma. Ed Ferraro, what the fuck? That's so bad when he did this. As a kid, uh... But now looking back on it, it's really bad. ...based imitation of Jim Ross. Following that, Asia would begin to appear more sporadically, with her eventually disappearing from TV altogether by the summer of 2000. And of course, when WWE bought out WCW less than a year after this, Asia would find out that her contract was not going to be picked up, with this leading to her retiring from the industry altogether and returning to the world of bodybuilding. But while she may not have made the jump to Vince McMahon's promotion in 2001, another notable WCW mid-carder would. Chuck Palumbo. Unfortunately for him, though, I was gonna say Chuck Sean Palumbo's attempts to mimic the Undertaker's biker character at that time would not Hold on, it was an Undertaker who originated a biker gimmick. It was DOA, wasn't it? The first biker characters, Eight Ball Skull, Chains, and Crush back in 98. But we're not going to mention them. Because, like, th that's the first I can remember in WWF only there was a biker character. But whatever. Undertaker well, it is. Yes, after returning to WWE in 2006 following a prior run, which saw him act as, at various points, a member of the full blooded Italians and the on screen lover of Billy Gunn. Palumbo would debut a newer incarnation of himself, one which took heavy inspiration from the Dead Man's run in the early <coughs> DOA. DOA. Well, to be fair, it wasn't as if the former WCW star didn't have experience with motorcycles in real life, as he was actually something of a bike aficionado, so much so that he would even run a personal business building his own hogs. 
And this then would end up coming to the attention of Vince McMahon, who, upon hearing about it, decided to create a new biker gimmick for Palumbo that would better fit his real-life character. So after a series of vignettes aired over the weeks that followed which saw him working on a number of different bikes, the former four-time WCW Tag Team Champion would make his re-debut in May of that year. That said, while he would pick up a number of lower card wins on the likes of Heat at this point, fans were quick to notice the similarities the gimmick shared with the dead man. He looks exactly the like The Undertaker, though. And so didn't Even really wearing the same jacket. The way management hoped they might. And this was why, despite eventually moving up to the SmackDown brand and entering into a brief on screen relationship with The Undertaker's future wife, Michelle McMahon, well, this is awkward. Would never really progress much further, and by November of 2008, Palumbo would be released from his contract. Of course, at least he had a chance of succeeding when he debuted. It's just a shame the same can't be said for Glenn Jacobs and Rick Bogner as, in 1996, after Kevin Nash and Scott Hall had left WWF to go join WCW, they'd be hired to play the new How Diesel is and Razor Ramon. How yes. is this a good thing? It was a bad... He said greatest copycats. They weren't that great. Vince McMahon upset that he lost two of his biggest stars and feeling like, as he owned the IP, he could simply recast the roles, he would bring in the two years later in September. Impact of that year Owl would say the same thing about Broken Matt Hardy. Of course, it should go and look how that went. Fans quickly saw through this ruse, however, with them immediately letting the company know how they felt about it by either raining down booze on the duo or just not reacting at all. And if we're being honest, Vince McMahon probably knew this was going to happen all along as, instead of having himself be shown as being publicly responsible for the decision, JR, he instead cast good old JR. as the man who had kayfabe brought the two into the company. But that didn't make things any more entertaining to watch as, failing to get over with the fans, the fake Diesel and Razor would soon fall down into undercard positions, usually losing to the real stars like Bret Hart, The Undertaker, and Rocky Maivia, all while getting nothing to show for it themselves. So realizing things were hey, got then, a tag team McMahon title match out of it. dropped the whole thing following the 1997 Royal Rumble, with Wagner leaving the company at this point to go work elsewhere, while Glenn Jacobs would be repacked into a far more famous and successful gimmick, Kane. And while Kane was riding high during the Attitude Era in the years that followed this, one more copycat gimmick would Gilbert. present itself as, in an attempt to mock Goldberg's 173-0 win streak over in WCW, WWF would introduce a figure who couldn't get a victory to save his own life, Gilberg. It brought the sparklers Gilberg, out for this one. Happened, would be portrayed by journeyman wrestler Dwayne Gill, with him making his first appearance at the 1998 Survivor Series, where he would lose to Mankind in round one of the Deadly Games tournament. Gilberg would continue his losing uh, streak the job after squad, joining my up favorite with the Job Squad, stable. a stable made up of fellow mid-carters such as Al Snow, Bob Holly, and Two Cold Scorpio. And to further add to the Goldberg parody then, Dwayne Gill would come out to the ring with sparklers and fire extinguishers sparklers. instead of fireworks, something which usually served to scare him out of his boots, all while he would get to utter his catchphrase following each loss, who's first? And at one point, this would even get to see him challenge Triple H for the WWE title on the August 31st, 1999 episode How do of I remember Down, a match which Brooklyn Brawler beating Triple H and, and I don't remember Gilbert taking, a further taking on Triple H at all. W while he was at it. Of course, this wouldn't be Gilberg's most notable moment as it turned out though, because after disappearing from the company in 2000, he'd return for a cameo in 2003, yeah. when as part of the Rock's feud with Goldberg, Dwayne Gill would be brought out to mock the former WCW champion, with this only serving to anger Bill and cause him to deliver a beatdown to his pretender. But while Goldberg may not have been a fan of being yeah, mimicked, Goldberg others, takes himself way Rogers, too seriously. Billy Graham and Randy Savage seem to have taken things far better with each of them understanding that, at the end of the day, having someone else build on what you've created isn't the worst thing in the world, as imitation really is the most sincere form of flattery. Well, yeah. guys, what did you think of Goldberg the video? Goldberg didn't get that Let at all. in the comments below. Because Goldberg doesn't understand. But yeah. <laughs> well, I love the photo of uh, Gilbert and James Ellsworth together in that one indie show they were together on. Showed the greatest jobber versus today's jobber. The greatest jobber of all time versus today's greatest jobber. I love that photo. But anyway, this was a great video. I still don't know how a uh, fake razor and fake diesel are on here because they're great copycats. They weren't really. It was like it was downhill from day one. But anyway, it brought us Kane. It brought us Kane, didn't it? Anyway, that's it for now. Humanoid Nation, Humanoid Freakout. Bye. Pasito a pasito, suave suavecito, nos vamos pegando poquito a poquito.